All right, so I'm watching this Rob Bell. I only caught the tail end of it thus far, so uh, I got to rewatch it before I make a full accounting of it. But I caught the tail end of the live of this Rob Bell versus some guy, I forget, on Is Heaven or Hell a Real Thing? And, you know, from what I caught on the tail end, now I'll, I'll flesh this out. It, this just at first glance is kind of what I suspected. I've talked in the past about wussy Christians versus conservative Christians, right? You know, the wussy Christians, were, and Rob Bell was my go-to example. Oh, you know, it's cool. God is love. I'm sure there isn't really a hell. I didn't realize that he was a universalist. I guess I could have could have realized that. But Now, the, the part about it that's interesting to me that I pointed out in the past, and at first glance, it seems to confirm what I suspected, that Rob Bell is so wildly controversial, partially because of decisions he makes. Not because his positions are so wildly controversial, but that his approach to how he handles his controversial decisions uh, opinions is really doesn't doesn't help. <laughs> it doesn't doesn't help him at all. Watching him in this video and he's in this this debate, the, just the tail end that I'm watching, he seems really disingenuous and he answers things in weird ways. And they ask him a straightforward question. He kind of goes like, you know, well, I went to such and such theology school. Do you think that's a conservative place? And and he seems kind of bizarrely defensive. Now, granted, he may have been raised as a more conservative Christian or fundamentalist, so he has partially deconstructed, so there's some, potentially some warrant for his defensiveness. I don't know. The only thing I was trying to point out is that if, you, if, I, if I showed you Rob Bell's book on the Bible, and I showed you Jordan Peterson's interpretations on the Bible, and I said, you tell me which one is which, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, just in terms of the technicalities of what they believe, except for the fact that Rob Bell is now apparently a universalist. I didn't know that. You won't be able to tell the difference. But one is considered an ally by the evangelical community, the other is not. And I thought that had more to do with their approach than what they technically believe. And this seems to confirm it, at least at first glance. Seems like Rob Bell's going out of the way to, to, to ruffle feathers and cause himself problems that he doesn't need to have. It's not very diplomatic. He's kind of anti-diplomatic from what I'm watching. And he gives weird half answers and like... Now, on the subject of universalism itself. Okay. I don't know. Neither does Rob Bell. That's the point. So for Rob, now when Rob Bell starts, in the part that I watch, he starts painting a picture of damnation. That sounds, yeah, pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, pretty bad. Some 14-year-old. <laughs> it's like, you know, God's going to, a billion years from now, God is still actively tormenting some 14-year-old who died without knowing the gospel. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay, that sounds a little bit, that sounds a little bit too mean-spirited. Sure. But that's kind of a distortion of what potentially happens. And it isn't universalism versus nobody. Now, somebody made a really good point in the live chat. He said, you know, I would never want to give somebody false hope. That's exactly why I would never declare myself a universalist. Even though, I, I mean, I guess I'd kind of be in favor of it. You know, I, I, it, it, I don't think it ne that necessarily means that Adolf Hitler goes unpunished. You know, maybe, I don't know. You know, I'm not God is the point. So technically what I believe on the subject is basically irrelevant. Why? I'm not God. I'm not deciding who, get, who goes to heaven and who doesn't. Neither are you. Neither is Rob Bell. But the reason why I would never declare myself a universalist is because of what some guy said in the chat. And it made sense to me. I would never want to give someone false hope. You know, I'm like, oh, you, you, you're good. <laughs> you know, don't worry about it. You're good. You're good. Wow, you're a nice person. You know, it's fine. And then you like, get there, and the guy's like, hey, you said I was fine. Ah! Oh, sorry, my bad. My bad. Yeah, I, you know, I didn't realize God was going to be really strict. So, you know, my fault. Yeah, I accept it. It's my fault. <laughs> See ya. <laughs> That's kind of why I'm not a universalist. It's like, what if I'm wrong? <laughs> then I haven't helped anybody at all. Now, the interesting thing why I bring it up is like, I mean, the go-to idea of the hellfire and brimstone preacher, the reason why, why people, why is there, why do somebody preach hellfire and damnation? Now, we don't really know anybody in our little circle of friends who's a, like, you know, hellfire and brimstone, of the hell, hellfire and brimstone crew, do we? Outside of, like, Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, Stephanie. <laughs> Stephanie is so, you know, she, she gets Old Testament. Oh, what was the atheists? They will turn around one day, and the, the earth will go cold around you, and you will be, you will eat not but, you will, you will eat not but burning hot coals, and drink not but burning hot Coca-Colas, and you will wish that you had never messed with Stephanie. <laughs> That's my elf.
hellfire. Stephanie is hellfire and damnation. No, it doesn't work. All right, whatever. Um, no, we don't know any hellfire and damnation crew, do we? The closest thing, I guess, is side ten Bruggen Kate. He he says he's, you know, he's really the 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 thing about it that's weird though is I have never seen a hellfire and brimstone type preacher convert anybody. They say, you know, I'm really I'm really stressed out. Why? Because I'm really worried about your eternal destiny. Because if you don't listen to me, you're going to burn forever. But they don't act like somebody who's actually really concerned about your eternal destiny. Because they don't really try to win you to the gospel. You know, they kind of just, so it doesn't quite gel. Do they actually believe that, like, some Hindu guy who never had any chance to hear, to hear about Jesus dies and, you know, God just said, he's like, hey, nobody ever told me God. It's like, I don't care. <laughs> You should have, you know, you should have got a plane to America and found a Bible study. I don't care if nobody told you. It's not my fault. Psh, go to hell. <laughs> it doesn't quite make sense with the character of God. That's why Rob Bell thinks that universalism is true. And I understand the logic, but what if you're wrong? <laughs> you know, what if you are wrong? It's all well and good to say that just seems too mean. Now, I hold to... Nothing but the truly evil ism. Uh oh. Yeah, they're after me. Oh, it's fire. No, it's oh, it's a fire. I thought it was the police. Police know better than to mess with me back in, in my. They know better than to come out to Malibu and try to try to jack me. They know how I roll. They know. They know how I roll. They they ain't gonna mess with me out here. This is my territory. I'll be like, you got a name, cop? You got a name? Yeah. You're gonna point that thing at me. You're gonna have to use it, cop. That's how I roll it back down every single time. Anyways, so, I hold to nothing but the truly evil-ism. That's what I believe. But, I gotta stress this, it doesn't really matter what I believe, nor does it matter what Rob Bell believes. Now, Rob Bell goes around preaching universalism, and it looks to me why he gets himself into trouble is because he preaches, he, he preaches in a way that's really undiplomatic. And when asked straightforward questions that make sense to, like, an evangelical or conservative Christian, he gives them weird roundabout answers that don't really address the central problem that the person's presenting. That's what I'm saying. Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson and Rob Bell, their views on the Bible are probably equally watered down and quote-unquote liberal, non-literal. Jordan Peterson gets himself into almost no trouble with the evangelical community. Why doesn't court it? He doesn't go around looking to get into trouble with the evangelical community. It looks to me like Rob Bell does. He kind of courts his bad PR with the, with the, with the you know, hardcore fundamentalist community. It looks to me like he's kind of sort of doing it on purpose. Now, I'm not sure about that yet. I'll, I will do another video when I watch the full debate. But that's, my, that's been my hunch all along, that some of these people that are quote-unquote, really controversial figures in the Christian community because they have some watered-down interpretation of the Bible, my hunch all along is that they're going out of their way to court trouble. It's not that people really object to them not believing this aspect of the Bible or not believing that aspect of the Bible or not being literalists. It's that they're kind of going out of the way to stick their finger in the nose of the, of the evangelical community. Why they do that, I'm not 100% sure. I don't know what the motivation is. Maybe they were raised fundamentalist, and then instead of going full atheist, they kind of adopted some of the, like, I hate, I hate fundamentalism of the atheist community. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure exactly why they would be doing that. Maybe they got some resentment there towards the fundamentalists because they were raised fundamentalists, and they're kind of acting out. Don't know. That could even be part of the motivation for them having these, these liberal, wussified views of the Bible. I don't think universalism is necessarily correct, and I kind of would be all for it, you know. I know, I don't, want, I don't even want out of Hitler to go to hell, Craig. Oh, poor Hitler. <laughs> I know, it's really sad. I feel really bad for him. So do I. I, I hear you. I feel his pain. <laughs> you know, he, he didn't really know what he was doing, Craig. He wasn't, yeah, okay, so he killed a few million people. What's a few million people for the end of time? <laughs> I, you know, I would feel really bad for Hitler too, I guess. <laughs> I don't really think, you know, there's a middle ground that Rob Bell isn't exactly latching onto between universalism, which means they I kind of ask him straight up, okay, if you're a universalist, what's the point of preaching the gospel at all? And then instead of going, well, um, coming up with a really good answer, he, he kind of dodges the question and acts like the question isn't automatic or organic. It's, a, it's the most obvious question in the world, especially to an evangelical. 
Okay, great. Universal is true. What's the point of preaching the gospel at all? And why is the Bible telling you this, 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 and the other thing if universalism is true? Now, as I've said in the past, there is scriptural predicate for universalism, so it isn't open and shut case on either end. Almost every single solitary controversial position you've ever heard theologically did not come out of nowhere. It's not like someone was just thinking and said, hey, this is my idea. Usually has a scriptural predicate. Annihilation has scriptural predicates. I forget offhand what they are, but I've heard somebody explain them in detail. You know, um, annihilation, if you don't know, is the idea that you burn for a little while. <laughs> you don't burn forever in a lake of fire. You burn for a little while in a lake of fire, maybe a million years or so. Oh, that's not, that doesn't sound too bad, Greg. Yeah, it's not that bad. <laughs> you, know, you, you just kind of burn till you extinguish yourself, and then you're, you're as if you were never born. Oh, that sounds fine. Yeah, it sounds perfectly fine. No, no reason. Cool, cool. No reason to become a Christian if that's all that happens. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, to, 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. No reason. No reason to convert to Christianity, Greg. Why? Because I'm, you know, ain't no big thing. I'm just burned for a million years and then I extinguish as if I'm never born. I can live with that. Yeah, it's not that bad. Doesn't sound that bad to me either, to tell you the truth. I don't know. Yeah, some, some of these, like, in-between positions are trying to reconcile what seems obviously cruel to most people. You know, if somebody dies not having known the gospel at all and they weren't a particularly bad person, do they burn forever on a lake of fire just because nobody happened to be around who was a Christian? It seems kind of, you know, seems kind of cruel and indifferent. And it doesn't strike me as in keeping with the character of God at all. Now, how Rob Bell thinks he knows, <laughs> I don't know. He's, he's not the one actually in charge. So what he actually believes on the subject is irrelevant. Honestly, it's totally irrelevant. And why he's going around saying this is so, I'm not sure either. So, uh, anyways, I'll give a full accounting of the... I'll give a full accounting when I watch the full debate. Now, one other thing I'll bring up and then I'll let you all... Then I'll let you all go. The actual... One of the things I'm starting to talk about now is how do people actually become Christians? Now, in my church that I go to on Sundays, prior to the coronavirus meltdown, uh, we don't go every Sunday, because a lot of times my wife has things to uh, work to do on Sundays and things like that, but the church that I normally attend, okay, every single solitary sun Sunday I go there, without exception, at least 15 people come to the Lord. At least 15 people become Christians on the spot. Usually it's more. Usually it's more like 30, 35 but a, a good portion of people goes, does anyone want to come, you know, receive the Lord? And a, a, a chunk of people walk up to the front, have a come to Jesus moment, and he does an altar call. Okay, he never, never in a million years has he ever been a fire and brimstone damnation preacher. I've never heard him mention hell. I've never heard him mention damnation. I've never heard him say, if you don't come to the front now, your eternal destiny is on the line. You can play around with God for only so long before the fire comes. He never does anything like that. That's my hellfire damnation preacher. You don't like it? That does good. It's better than my Stephanie hellfire preacher. It's pretty good. That does pretty good. So whatever. So he never does that at all. He's, he's not, it's not technically a seeker-friendly church. Um, that's a label that means, you know, wussed out to the point where they barely talk about the gospel at all. He's kind of spirit-led and spirit-filled, and his theology is fairly strong, and he talks openly about spiritual things. So it's not seeker-friendly in the sense that most people usually mean that. It's not christianity light necessarily. He just never mentions, you know, he just never mentions, like, hellfire, damnation, any of that type of stuff. A lot of churches don't, you know, they don't. Maybe for most of these people who were raised in fundamentalist traditions where they brought up all the time, that could be true. I probably believe that, you know, and they, they tell you you shouldn't do that because that's the devil and shouldn't do that because that's the devil and don't turn that on. Don't, don't, don't watch that show. Why? It's the devil. Ah! <laughs> don't, don't ever watch that show. Why? It's the devil. <laughs> so they could be right about that. But, where am I going with this? Okay, so it's not a seeker-friendly church in the way that most people mean it. It's not, you know, wussified to the point of no, no gospel at all. It's not, you know, watered down the gospel so that it's not even there. It's just kind of like pop psychology. Yeah, everybody feel good. And Jesus, Jesus loves everybody and everybody feel good. It's not really one of those. Now, it is 
kind of like, being that it's in LA, it's, it's a lot more, um, I, I don't know what the right word is, like a cool church, kind, it's not really cool, but it's almost cool. Like the, it's not, it's really not cool, but it's almost, it's like the music is, you know, modern kind of rock oriented worship music. There's even some hip hop influences. Yeah, man, that's so cool. Oh my God. Sound. Yeah. This is even, and you know, it's a lot, there's a lot of African Americans, it's like half black to church because it's LA. So there's a lot of, there's a big, there's a big creative community influence. It's not like the first church I went to. The first church I went to, the music worship in particular was off the charts. Because it was L.A., so there are people who have come out here to become actual musicians. So there was real musical talent in the church. For example, I think I've mentioned this before, but one of the in one of the in-house worship bands right before the church fell apart was Lifehouse. Um, that's an actual pop band. They had like a number one song for a while. The song that they actually went to number one was. Uh, I'm falling ever more in love with you. I'm hanging by a moment. <laughs> That's not how it sounds. That's not how it goes. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember exactly how it goes. Something like that. But they sang that as a worship song. The first time I ever heard that song, it was being sung by Lifehouse, Jason Wade, um, as a worship song at my church. That's the type of level of talent we were talking about in Malibu. And the acting uh, talent was off the charts, too. There was a lot of fairly well-known actors there. Um... Because of where it's located, you know, people came out to L.A. to make it as musicians and actors wound up going to church here. It wasn't necessarily seeker friendly either. It was it was a little bit like there was some tension between there was some not quite biblical like, I don't know, it's hard to explain. There was too much too much attachment to like. Let's be cool. Let's be relevant. You know, we got to do things that are relevant. We got to be cool. Um, but where am I going with this? So Jason, yeah, I knew I knew him actually. I knew him pretty well. He, I knew him as well as I know anybody who's listening to me who I interact with on Twitter or YouTube. Just about, except for like Stephanie, I know a little better. Almost everybody else, I know him about the same way. So if one of you become famous. And reality check, you won't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what? No, you won't. But if you were to become famous, like JB, for example, you know, I could go, hey, I knew him. I knew him about, I knew Jason Wade about as well as I know JB. Like, I, I chatted with them all the time. I knew his mom really well. She was a, a church elder. Um, but that's the level of talent that generally walked through the door at the Malibu Vineyard. Why? Because of where it was located. And it's a little bit like that in the Valley, too. There's a lot of people who are semi-professionals in the industry, if, if they haven't quite made it, they will or might or could. Um, but it's not necessarily, neither of these two churches are seeker-friendly in the way that term is usually meant. It's not like, let's not talk about the gospel at all, let's not talk about Jesus at all, let's not talk about sin at all. You know, the, my pastor in the valley always mentions all of those type of religious ideas. Um, the only thing that got avoided a lot or never got brought up in either place was hellfire, damnation, and if you don't accept this, you're going to perish. Um, my only point in all of this circuitous conversation is that each, both of those churches, people constantly, every time they did an altar call, every single Sunday on both churches, 20 or so people would become Christians on the spot, at least. At least. That's a low ball estimate. On average, I'd say about 25, 26 people become Christians on the spot, both places. Now, what I'm saying about that is I don't see the hellfire and damnation idea, the fact that if, it, if I don't tell about this, you're going to perish forever. I don't even see that as being a really good particular motivating force in converting people, is my point. So at some point, I'm going to start talking about the church I go to and why people actually become Christians there. And when I talk about the some of this is politics, some of this is politics, some of this is politics, there's, there's an actual through line of observation between the fact that I go to a church where people become Christians usually every single Sunday and the stuff that he actually talks about and what motivates people to go, hey, I'm in, I want part of this, because it isn't argumentation. He doesn't 
solve arguments about the Testament. Where you might have heard that the Old Testament, you know, here's what I think about God and the Amalekites, and he starts telling him an argumentation about, you know, or he doesn't bring up, well, in Thomas Aquinas, one of the five proofs, here's a proof. He does, never brings up anything like that. He basically does like kind of a version of what I do in that I'm sure he's prayed up and he's spirit led and he just kind of talks about whatever he feels like talking about. And that's exactly how he runs his sermons. Just kind of talks about whatever, whatever's on his plate that day. And why? It'd be a really interesting thing to observe as to why some people are going, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. This is what I want. This is where I belong. Now, obviously, I believe that they're, you know, they're being, their heart is being touched by the Holy Spirit. But obviously, if you're an atheist listening to me, you don't believe that. So I'm just talking about from a psychological perspective emotional point of view, perspective, why does it work? What's actually going on? Because most of the time, well, one of the things that I've been pointing out, and I really think this is deeply true, that a lot of the stuff that we talk about on the surface is not really what time it is. That there are deeper things at play that go on. So he is usually, unconsciously, because he's a talented preacher, okay, he's not super talented, he's not the best preacher who ever walked the face of the earth. The guy, the original guy at the Malibu Vineyard was super talented. He actually died of cancer, and he was from South Africa, and he was starting to get noticed. He was starting to get on, like, Christian CBN, starting to get interviewed nationally. Why? Because he was super talented. As a preacher, he was, it was mind-boggling how good he could be. Like, he had a real gift. And had he been walking right and, you know, walking the walk correctly, he could have really gone far. Um, so, that was really too bad. Um... What, what am I trying to say? What happens when he starts preaching a message? He's not actively trying to convert people. He's not actively trying to convince you or anybody listening to him that God is real. But he winds up doing it. How? Why? Because he's circumventing the conscious mind to some degree. And to, to the point that somebody is listening... Okay, let's say somebody does think it's God actually speaking to them at the church. What usually happens is the guy's circumventing the rational process and talking deep to the unconscious and activating things in the unconscious mind of the experience. See, when, when Pine Creek Doug tried to just kind of dismiss what happened to me that night, even if you, if you take the spiritual out of it, you can't dismiss it. Why? Because if he was just sizing me up as a human being, which is eminently plausible, and kind of he's good enough of a talent and gift to... To take a general educated guess about how I hold my body type and what happened was the guy prophesied over me and it really spoke to me in the moment and I broke down and cried, okay? Now, let's just say for argument's sake that that's not actually God. This is one of the things when I say Pine Creek, did, I'm perfectly willing to explore that idea. Pine Creek wasn't even interested in having an honest conversation from that angle. He was just interested in trying to prove to me that it's not God. I'll, let me prove to you that it can be God. Can you think of any other thing it could be? No, I can't even though I talk about it all the time. No, I can't possibly think of any other thing it could have been. Um, so, let's just say for argument's sake that it's not God. So it's just a talent for what? For, for, for sizing up a human being. So this guy was labeled as a prophet. And I come up and he starts saying all these things to me and, I, and the, the thing, it becomes somewhat overwhelming to me and I break down the moment and start crying. And I literally felt like that was God speaking to me in the moment. Now, let's say it wasn't. So what's going on? The guy is talented. But the super talented thing isn't to be debunked, dismissed, discredited either. Why? Because he'd be super talented and he'd be super perceptive. And he'd see me coming towards him, finds out I'm from New York. First thing he asks me, I'm from New York. He's like, oh, cool, a New Yorker. So, and he sees me, how I'm dressed, sees how I hold my body weight. And he's doing a lot of unconscious processing that was probably really spot on accurate. This guy's probably been through a lot. You could, I could tell that by somebody when they're walking up to me, how they hold themselves. This person's been through a lot. This, pers this person's really suffering. I could do that easily. You walk, you 20, you, you walk 20 feet in front of me, I, could, I can know things about you that you don't know about yourself. Why? Because of things that you are projecting unconsciously. I'm one of these type of people like this prophet guy was, is that I could pick up a lot of information about somebody just by ob observation, just by tactile, just by uh, being around you. I hang out with most people for an hour. I know things about them they do not know about themselves. How I get that information, God reveals it to me. 
<laughs> no, it's just not God revealing it to you. But that doesn't mean it's to be debunked, dismissed, discredited. It's still just as fascinating, just as worthy of understanding. That's my point. It's my point when I criticize Pine Creek Doug's methodology. Why? He's only trying to limit out the spiritual. That's his sole approach. That's the whole point of his approach. And when I say that's not scientific at all, I mean that's not scientific at all. He's only got one axe to grind and one agenda. It's not the most interesting aspect about the totality of a religious experience. Okay, let me prove my point about it and then not even understand anything else about it. So he didn't ask me any real questions about the experience, didn't really try to understand the experience, doesn't know anything about it other than he's sure that it's not God. You see what I'm saying? There's a lot of information to be gleaned just on the mechanics of how, how that experience takes place and what's actually going on. And the fact that it, you know, it might not have been technically, literally God speaking to the guy in the moment, but there's still a lot of fascinating information, fascinating talents that are actually playing out in real time and tethered to the real world and worth understanding for their own sake. That's why I say science is on my side. Why? Because science tries to understand things for the purposes of understanding, not to rule out the thing that I don't want it to be, but to understand something in its totality, in its full complexity. And when I say atheists are, or generally speaking, incurious about that, I mean that they are. They don't really want to understand. They want to rule out God. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Debunk, dismiss, discredit the idea that it's God, period. Other than that, they don't even really want to talk about it or think about it at all. Not, uh, not everybody, but that's a general rule. That's what I meant. Now, where am I going with this? Okay, so, when a pastor preaches and people become Christians on the spot, he is not making arguments for the existence of God. He is not convincing anybody. But he is actually convincing people. He's, he is circumventing the logical mind. And he is circumventing the rational thought process. And addressing something much deeper inside of each human being. Which is the actual place where motivation is born. And it's the actual place where important beliefs are born. There's the logical predicate of your belief and there's the emotionally compelling aspect of your belief. The emotional resonance. The thing that makes it important to you. The thing that makes you willing to defend it. The thing that makes you honestly care about it. And that isn't the logical predicate. What he does, and he does it by talent, intuitively, without even really thinking about it, is circumvent the logical mind and speak to something deep inside of somebody else. So a person goes, this is what I've been looking for, sign me up for Christianity. And he isn't trying to do it, per se. And he certainly never brings up hellfire and damnation, never heard him say anything about hellfire and damnation, but going there for 10 years. Never. Never heard him once say, you know, you, you accept this or you're done. You accept this or you're going to burn. Never heard him say any of that. So, just worth, just worth thinking about. That's it. Just throwing that out there as food for thought. Nothing, nothing, no conclusion to be drawn yet, but it's where I'm going when I say some of this is politics, some of this is politics. When I hear the objections to God, when I hear the deconversion, there's a part of it they aren't saying. There's a part of it they are not conscious, they are, may not be aware of, but they aren't saying. And it's the most important part. And when people come into the church and they go, aha, sign me up for Jesus. Let's assume that person does, didn't have a total road to Damascus experience didn't fall on their face because the clouds opened up and the sun shined right on their face, right? So they didn't have a full-on Damascus Road experience. But something spoke to them in the moment. And if it wasn't technically God, then it's worth even understanding just as a secular phenomena. Something spoke deep to them in the moment, so they said, sign me up. That's really what's going on here. That's really where, where the truth lies, the important truth. It's really where the truth lies, the important one. So, um, I've, uh, I think that was pretty clear. If it's not, it doesn't really matter. Rambling around is what I do, guys. <laughs> yeah, I started off with Rob Bell and wound up in, and put you in church, and now you converted. Hallelujah. Um, rambling around is what I do. Again, there's a reason why I ramble around, because there's, there's some things I would never say otherwise. You know, some things I get to just by poking around. Um, I will watch the full Rob Bell thing and I will do another accounting on the Rob Bell. It's really interesting to me because I think some of this is politics really applies to him. 
his, his dispute between him and the fundamentalist community seems to be just bad politics. He just kind of wants to, to have kind of subconsciously spitting in their face for no particular reason. You can, you can adopt controversial views and still get along with hardcore evangelicals if you're somewhat diplomatic about it. He's choosing not to be. That's what I see so far. Now, I could be wrong about that. I will tell you if that's honest to God, the truth, after I watch it, watch the, the full debate. But that's what I've always suspected, that some of these controversial figures are being controversial on purpose. A little, going out of their way a little bit to, to, to spit in the face of the evangelical or the, the conservative Christian. They're, they're picking fights with them unnecessarily. And that the conservative Christian would be, would, would be fine to just kind of half denounce them half-heartedly as a heretic and let it go. They protest Rob Bell. The last time I heard about it, I think they protested him. So that's a little different. So that's all, that's all, that's all for now. That's all I got. Just some observations. You know, food for thought. That's all it was, kids. That's all it was, kids. Just food for thought. That is all for now. Mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.